This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Ozark United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here this morning to worship with us. If you're listening this morning on 104.9, we want to welcome you as well. Just a few announcements to highlight with you. This evening, we'll have our worship and based upon the chapel, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. On Wednesday, we conclude with our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Please be aware, Ash Wednesday, we will begin our Wednesday Lenten services. We've got an impressive lineup. Dr. Jeff Wilson will be here for Ash Wednesday at noon. It's about a 30-minute service, and then we'll eat lunch together. We've got Bobby Laster coming March the 9th. Megan Kelly on March 16th. Sarah Shaver on March 23rd, Tim Trent, March 30th, and John Ed Matheson on April the 6th. So I hope that you will come along and be with us on Wednesdays during the season of Lent as we get ready to celebrate Easter together. On Tuesdays, Lazarus Awakening, a new Bible study at 6 o'clock. And also be aware, uh, public commitment Next Sunday, we ask if you would prayerfully think about making your commitment, a three-year commitment to support our new CLC building and place it on the altar as your spiritual act of worship. And Reveal Celebration Sunday will be March the 6th. We'll have one service at 11 o'clock in the Family Life Center, and lunch will be provided afterwards. Lots going on in the life of our church, and we appreciate so much uh, our Pastor Emeritus. He is going to give us uh, our sharing today about building generations of faith. Reverend Dr. Billy Gaither, take it away. Good morning. I was asked to share with you the planning and the building of the Family Life Center and how it took place. Since I have five minutes to describe it, let me summarize it in four words. Need driven and dream fulfilled. In the early 1990s, a group of men and women began to envision and dream about our church and her mission. Two prior renovations, building ventures, the beautiful sanctuary, as well as the remodeling of the rest of the church complex had already taken place. New dreams and visions began to emerge. And these visions and dreams included a mission statement, renewed mission, intense Bible study, the disciple Bible studies, and the specific mission goals. Among those visions and dreams was a family life center. Prayer and conversations within the membership gained inspiration and information. Homework was done. And carefully and deliberately, we did our vision and dream building. Need driven included need for more classrooms, a need for a large fellowship hall, for a larger kitchen, for a physical activity complex, a walking and running track, a gym, which would be an all-purpose space, and a handball room, which could also double as a safe room in severe weather a chapel, and a stage, an all-purpose room, and so forth. In short, the architects, Seymour and Lisenby, used the old stained glass windows and panels to make an ambiance that is appealing. The building more than doubled the square foot capacity to the entire church complex. The meditation garden was designed to bring a restful, peaceful place and a columbarium. Several capital fund drives paid the cost 
in a little over 10 years. That total cost was well over $3 million. Additional property was purchased for parking and reserve parking. In March 25th, 2001, we broke ground. A little over a year from that, in June and to July in 2002, we began to fill the new building, Family Life Center. Dream fulfilled became a reality. Praise be to our God. The bridge builder by Will Allen Gould goes like this. An old man going along highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed the chasm, deep and wide. Why build this bridge at evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there followed me one today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been as naught to me, to that fair-haired youth came a pitfall could be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Another translation, the message translation, it has it saying this. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Amen. Thank you, Billy. So you can say a lot in five minutes. <laughs> that was great. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as David leads us in our prelude.
Please join with me for our responsive reading. The kingdom of God is here and coming. It is yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all was leavened. It is treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid and then joyfully sells all he has and buys the field. It is a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one of great value, sells all of his possessions and buys the pearl. The kingdom of God belongs to those who receive it like a little child. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. Let us pray together our congregational prayer. God, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Out of the years and years of your creating, our lives have come to this point of meeting. We are in awe before you, amazed to discover the depth of your love. O oh God, show us how to be part of your kingdom. Amen. Please stand for a hymn of praise. A mighty fortress is our God. Hymn number 110.
us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. forward to receive our tithes and offerings. Let us ask God's blessings on these gifts. Gracious God, we know that all good things come from you. As we give these gifts to you today, we ask that you would bless them, that they may be a blessing for our church and for our community and for all the world, that more might come to know of you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.
Our hymn of preparation, Oh How I Love Jesus, hymn number 170.
Lovely. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David and choir. This morning, the scripture comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of God for the people of God. This past week, I was in the Family Life Center gathering supplies, and there was a toddler class of the CLC there working out some of their excess energy. As sometimes happens when toddlers see someone new, I soon had a whole crowd of toddlers coming along after me as I was gathering my supplies. There was one little boy in particular who was peppering me with a whole bunch of questions. What's your name? What are you doing? Where are you going? Et cetera, et cetera. And then he asked me, what are those supplies for? And I said, for Bible study. And this toddler let out the biggest gasp I had ever heard. <gasps> and I said, I know, I can't believe they let me teach Bible study either. I am so glad for kids and that the ways they can remind adults of the wonders of everyday life, that is what this toddler did for me. In so many different ways, kids invite adults to see things adults might otherwise miss when their focus is on other things. For one such example of this, see the disciples. The disciples in today's story probably thought that they were just doing their job, crowd control, trying to keep some sense of order in the mayhem. All these people wanting to speak to Jesus crowding in. They had to draw the line somewhere. Jesus has already told the disciples that he will die and be resurrected. They definitely did not understand exactly what that meant, but it was clear that something was going on. Perhaps they thought they could serve Jesus best by making sure Jesus had some space. But in the moment when they pushed children away, they were missing the bigger picture. This moment wasn't a distraction from more important ministry. This moment is the ministry that Jesus was called to do. In a time when we carry so much on our minds, navigating the ongoing effects of the pandemic, worries over international politics, the millions of ways we get caught up in turmoil, both within and outside of ourselves, we too can miss what is in front of us. And what is in front of us is Jesus and the kingdom of God. As Jesus does so often, even in his indignation, he invites the disciples to expand their view of God's kingdom and who belongs. He reminds them once again, essentially, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And through this story, Jesus and the children reveal to all of us a God whose kingdom is for children. Children have a vaulted status in at least some of modern American society. I often hear of the busyness that can crowd in when families attempt to balance kids' schedules of sports practices, drama rehearsals, bands, honor societies. At its best, though we don't always live up to this, our society sees children as our hope for the future and invest in them that they might be able to explore all they were created to be. But things were different in these ancient times. On the hierarchy of individuals and society, children were on some of society's lowest rungs. 
thoroughly reliant on others for survival and on society's margins. It wouldn't have been an uncommon thing, though, what these children were doing, coming up to Jesus for a blessing. Barclay says it was commonplace, even, for mothers to bring their children to be blessed by a famous rabbi. So here come children, considered lowly in their time, asking for blessings. The disciples push them away, but Jesus reveals those on the margins, like these children, are directly in the middle of the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God that has come and is coming. It is a kingdom where God's love reigns, instituted by Jesus' advent on earth, where those who are often overlooked are centered, where those who have been dismissed are seen, where all are welcome. It's here, even now, in this world that is still being healed by the loving hands of God. And we are invited to participate in it. Jesus says, it belongs to children and those like them. But why children? These children did nothing to earn God's blessings. They didn't make the honor roll at school or be the star of their track team. They didn't run themselves ragged, trying to please a million and one demands and dot every I and cross every T perfectly. The kingdom of God belongs to children because they simply came to Jesus and received what Jesus had in store for them. Rodney Cooper says, how do children receive gifts? with anticipation, joyfully and thankfully, without believing they did anything to deserve it. They simply receive. And what Jesus had in store was blessing and warmth and love. Jesus had time for them. Jesus has time for us. Jesus has time for everyone in the world. Cooper will go on to say that the way children receive gifts is how we are invited to receive the gifts of Christ's redemption. There is nothing we can do to earn God's blessing. It is freely bestowed on us. The redemption of Christ is freely given, and we are invited to run up to Jesus and receive it. Can you imagine being one of those children that day, Jesus' arms coming round you, the arms of someone who is safe and kind, scooping you up into the arms of Jesus where you are blessed and known and loved. What a wonderful place to be. Don't you want that for literally everyone on earth? My favorite part of today's scripture is the last verse we read today when it says, and he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. He blessed them. Can you imagine what Jesus might have said in these moments? How he might have blessed these children? Perhaps he reminded them that God knows their name, even in a society where they were overlooked. Perhaps he told them that as they grew and matured, God would always be with them. I wonder, too, what blessings are bestowed by God today on the children on our margins, those who slip through the cracks of our systems, those on the background, those disciples of today might be tempted to quiet down. God is still blessing them, too. Blessed are the one in four children in Alabama who are food insecure. Blessed are the children who receive abuse at the hands of adults. Blessed are the thousands of children in foster care in this state. Blessed are the children in the juvenile justice system. Blessed are all of these children too because the kingdom of God belongs to them. May Jesus take the children of our church and of our communities, all of the children, into his arms and bless them. Just last Sunday, 
I was coming downstairs from our evening chapel service and I heard such joyous sounds coming from the fellowship hall that I had to go and see what was happening. It was first kids having their Valentine's Day party. Kids were making Valentines to share with others. And as these kids surrounded themselves with cut out hearts and lots of glue and glitter and words of love, they were a picture of the kingdom of God right then and there. First kids received such love from God, from their church family, from their families, from each other. And from this love, they chose to share love and care and kindness with others. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I am grateful for the work of First Ozarks Christian Learning Center. The CLC is a place where kids are welcome. They are taught of God, of God's love, and the love of God's people for them. The new CLC building is a chance for the church to welcome more children, that even more might know the warmth and kindness of God. Commitment Sunday is next Sunday, February 27th. And I invite you in the week ahead to pray and consider how you can be part of this work, that more might know of God's love. Christians know that all are invited to be part of God's kingdom as we freely receive God's gift of redemption. This gift of God is open to everyone. This God revealed to us in Jesus Christ Jesus, who welcomes those others dismiss, who keeps sharing and inviting people in, who keeps blessing them. This Jesus, who the power of the Holy Spirit is instituting the kingdom of God here on earth. This kingdom of God belongs to children and those like them, those who freely receive God's gifts. God's kingdom is one that we seek where all of us, especially those marginalized and overlooked, might be welcomed into the blessing, loving arms of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to rise for our hymn of invitation, Seek Ye First, number 405.